Um, in this talk, uh, I want to talk about, as the title says, um, design automation and software tools for quantum computing. And I understand that uh, you in the audience, you already have participated in a couple of uh, talks about quantum computing. So I really want to drag the focus on um, computer science, software tools, and so on and so forth. And accordingly, uh, because you're all, I assume most of you already have some sort of a background, I, I, I sort of will skip about motivating why quantum computing and so on and so forth. I think everyone in the audience is kind of understanding that quantum computing is the next big thing. Uh, we have interesting applications. Maybe uh, it is not entirely clear what um, applications really will turn out to be beneficial for using quantum computing or not. But I think we can all agree that uh, this new technology, quantum computing, is something which is worth investigating and um, further doing work on. And what I want to particular focus on is um, that what are the tasks of design automation experts or software developers in this particular domain? And I want to motivate that at the beginning by just sort of having a quick look a little bit, how is everything uh, evolving with respect to hardware? And I'm, I'm just doing this very quickly and also the slide a little bit outdated. And this is just a sort of an, an, a, a proxy slide in order to make the argument that indeed there is a tremendous improvement in the hardware. It is not entirely clear yet whether or not these developments in the past years in the development of quantum uh, computing hardware is comparable to what, to what we have seen in the electrical engineering world, uh, spoke, speaking about Moore's law. But certainly if you check out some roadmaps from vendors like IBM, but also Google, Rigetti, and all the startups which are there, there is a definitely in a development where we can see quantum computing hardware gets more and more mature, more and more complex, more and more scalable, even though certainly not all of the uh, problems are resolved yet and still have to be tackled, but the development and the scale of the development is kind of impressive. And to me, this is an actually interesting analogy, although we are just at the beginning here, but if you really uh, check out how we uh, developed and how, the, uh, how conventional computers emerged, you see several uh, analogies. Um, for example, also here at the beginning of conventional computers, we had bulky computers. And then we had Moore's law and the digital revolution. And literally, this kind of exponential in, uh, uh, increase in the performance of conventional computers. And I'm not saying that we definitely will have that for quantum computing as well. But we certainly have currently a development where quantum computing gets more and more complex. And now the main thing here to observe from a perspective of how can computer science or tool developments help here is that uh, in the conventional realm, of course, you had all those successes because of the ingenuity of electrical engineers and the physical accomplishments making conventional hardware. But one reason that we have today electronic uh, electronics and computers each everywhere is because we've got EDA tools, which enable their successes. And these EDA tools may include several different uh, schemes, such solvers, AI, decision diagrams, but we have an entire community, something that, that, namely the design automation community, who develop very um, efficient and powerful tools to handle problems of enormous complexity. And designing a conventional circuit with, with, with some, which quite often have more states than the number of atoms in the universe is a complex task. So the EDA community was very successful in developing these methods and also in incorporating all those methods into very elaborated design flows. And as a result, we now have um, electronic devices, smartphones, um, sensors, aircraft controllers, train controllers, uh, digital uh, digitalization and, and cars and every aspect of our daily life just because of those tremendous develop developments which includes uh, several disciplines in computer science and now if you want if you consider a little bit similarly that we may have a similar development in quantum computing then we have to also check out okay how is this sort of this kind of tool support design automation expertise evol evolving in uh, quantum computing and here we have to say we have software tools, but we certainly don't have these elaborated software tools we take for granted in the conventional world. We're at the beginning, we have uh, ecosystems like Qiskit, like CIRQ, and so on and so forth. But I wouldn't compare uh, the top-notch quantum computing design methods with the top-notch um, electronic design automation methods so far. And also when it comes to uh, powerful design flows, also here, as I said, we have ecosystems to develop new quantum algorithms, but I still wouldn't say, I would still, I still would see the, 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 the ingenuity and the, the complexity
complexity of a design flow for a conventional uh, application is still magnitudes better than what we've got for quantum computing. And all this motivates the question whether or not we can have, uh, whether or not we have quantum computers, but no efficient methods to use them. Or to rephrase that a little bit, uh, what we are working on and uh, what the entire design automation community is working on, how can we develop tools which are as powerful and as well integrated into flows and as we have in the engine, electrical engineering or electrical circuit co conventional computing uh, technology, how can we develop these kind of tools in quantum computing as well? And this is a little bit what is motivating my work here and my, my talk here today, because if, it, it, to some extent, it means reinventing the real, but to, to some extent, we also have different challenges which we need to tackle. And um, what, of course, First of all, when we talk about, okay, how can we get a design uh, flow and design tools which are as powerful as in the electrical domain, one thing, of course, is we first have to deal with a completely different programming paradigm. While also in the conventional one, at some point, we develop assembly languages and high-level uh, high programming languages and so on and so forth, the main paradigm has never really changed from what we are common, uh, commonly used as human beings. We still had addition, subtraction, multiplication, and we just had to formulate that in a particular syntactical way, like uh, C equals A plus B. So programming languages, although certainly not sometimes not that simple, still were really related to the computing paradigm we took for granted as human beings. In quantum computing, we have to deal with a different paradigm, which is not that obvious or not intuitive anymore. And one aspect, and that's just the simplest aspect, of course, is that every quantum operation inherently is reversible, which simply means that something like a, multi a direct multiplication such as this one here is not directly easily possible because, again, uh, although you can easily do determine the product for a factor of four and five, the other way around is not that possible, right? And this is one of the main issues. How do you define quantum applications? How do you develop tools for that where such a an, um, such an, um, paradigm does not work out and where you have to find constantly workarounds such as this one here so that you have to, in order to conduct the multiplication, you have to incorporate it into a fashion like, like that where we add another ancillary variable in order to uh, allow for this particular reversibility. And this is just one example how the entire paradigm has changed. And this not even mentions that, of course, the, 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 the elephant in the room that in quantum computing, we're not just dealing with zeros and ones, but we're dealing with superposition, with literally with everything in between. We're dealing with entanglement and so on and so forth. We also deal with the fact that suddenly we don't have only additions and subtraction and multiplications, again, operations which we are all very familiar with as human beings, but suddenly we have to think and understand uh, in terms of operations that represent unitary transformations. What is a Hadamard gate doing? Still, this can be, we can develop some sort of an um, intuition about that. Uh, we can in, uh, develop an intuition about Pauli gates and so on and so forth. But this is different to what we usually used to as uh, being uh, as human beings. And a couple of other things uh, come up as well. Physical constraints, error is a huge issue. So what I'm trying to say here is, of course, when we want to develop uh, design automation tools or software tools for quantum computing, we can reuse. 20, 30 years of experiences from the conventional realm, but we have to tackle all of these challenges. And this is just one side of the thing. Another thing is also uh, that the complexity increases uh, substantially as well. And to this, just let me brief you, uh, bring you this brief example of the simulation here. Simulation, I mean logic simulation, is actually a very simple and easy task in the conventional realm, because if you have a circuit like that, and if you have an input assignment like that, simulation is linear in the number of gates, because all you have to do is you just have to traverse every gate, determine the corresponding um, output of this gate, depending on the input of this gate, you're doing this here, you're doing this for this gate, you're doing, doing that for that gate. In, in general, it's a linear process, which gives you um, a simulation result, a logic simulation result in linear time. And by this is actually a very simple and easy um, problem which can very efficiently be solved in conventional circuits. Now, if you have quantum circuits, as said, you don't have zeros and ones anymore, but you have to represent in particular state an input state, for example, in terms of a vector like that. For all possible basic states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, you have to prepare 
um, you have to provide a dedicated amplitude representing the overall state. And this eventually requires um, the representation of an exponentially large vector. And this is one of the easiest examples to showcase a little bit because of this exponential representation of the input state and of course of all of, of all of the other states as well suddenly a task which actually was very simple in the conventional realm suddenly renders exponentially complex and this is one of the another challenges we have to deal with and besides that we have problems like that in quantum computing we still have to do heavily work interdisciplinarily which is still a major uh, um, roadblock quite often sometimes it requires and i know that from my own experiences sometimes we need several meetings with physicists for example to just understand the physical constraints correctly uh, terminology and formalization often is not um, is not really well defined or different communities using using different terminologies and formalizations and all this is a problem which we don't have that much so anymore in the conventional realm in the conventional realm we've got uh, even though also here computer science and electrical engineers and so work together, but we've got established models, we've got established uh, programming languages and established understanding, and all this is sort of developing new. And the, overall, what I'm trying to say a little bit here is that when we want to design tools and methods, design automation methods for quantum computing, which which are as powerful as the design automation methods from the conventional realm, we have to tackle these, change, uh, these challenges that we deal with a completely different paradigm that suddenly many, many so presumably simple tasks became um, really, really complex and that many, many of the questions of the, uh, of, of the issues of the models of the languages are still not established or still developing and changing very rapidly. And those are the challenges. And now what I would like to do in my talk is sort of like to give you a glimpse, a sketch where nevertheless, despite these challenges, we can utilize design automation knowledge. And where, and, and I also want to give you a little bit an idea how maybe you as someone interested in this particular field, maybe uh, someone who has some background in design automation, how you can contribute to quantum computing as well without the need to necessarily become a quantum physicist. So that's sort of like, what this talk should showcase or supposed to showcase or what I planned it to showcase. And for this purpose, what, what I would like to main focus on my talk is on that I'm going to sketch a couple of the methods developed and the tools developed for the design of quantum algorithms, quantum circuits and quantum systems. And for this purpose, I have a couple of main messages. Namely, I want to first talk a little bit what on, on the basis of these tools, what could be core methods or core data structures, which might be uh, useful to um, develop post-morning tools. And then I would like to briefly showcase two examples, uh, or depending on how you count it, three examples on how to solve with this expertise, with design automation expertise, certain problems such as the synthesis of quantum functionality or the simulation of a quantum computation or the verification of it. And this is sort of like, in a sense, like what I would like to sketch. And this is literally my plan for the next, from now on, let's say 30, 40 minutes. And I want to start again, as I said, with a first rough overview on, on certain core methods or data structures which might be useful for this purpose. And here, one dedicated data structure, uh, and I might be a little bit biased here um, because we heavily work on that, are decision diagrams. And um, of course, in the talk uh, from us, we have to talk about decision diagram. I promise I'm keeping it short, but I would like to sketch a little bit the main idea. Decision diagram is a data structure we heavily use in Munich, and which, in my opinion, have some very interesting um, benefits. What's the main idea? You've got... Uh, data structures are used in order to represent quantum operations and quantum states. And what you can see here on the slide is um, a unitary matrix representing a quantum operation. And as I said before, similar to quantum states, operations in order to represent them in a naive fashion, like in a unitary matrix as shown here, require an exponential amount of uh, memory. Because for an n qubit, um, system in order to define a corresponding operation, you need a two to the power of n times two to the power of n large unitary matrix, such as this one here. And this is one of the main challenges I've sketched before with the simulation example. This is how uh, main challenges of um, this whole domain here. So, how can decision diagrams help here? One idea is the main idea of decision diagrams is to decompose the overall representation, in this case, into four submatrices. 
and then try to utilize synergies out of that. So how does it work? So first we having, we're introducing a node like that one. And this node has four successes, each successors defining or representing one of these four submatrices we've got before. So uh, the top, top the, this here is the top uh, left submatrix. This here is the top, uh, the, the bottom left matrix, the bottom right matrix, the bottom, uh, the top right matrix. So this is the first task. And then as I said, we're trying to identify redundancies. And if you look at that, you can see these two submatrices here, they are identical. And because of that, I don't have to store them uh, separately. I can actually store them I, I can, and can actually share the, this thing here. And then depending on what uh, um, edge I'm, I'm following, I will end up there and I will basically represent still all elements of my matrix. Just I'm using some sharing here, some hashing if you want. So this is the first idea. Besides that, we can then further also you know, do some things like, for example, if you can see all those entries in this matrix here, they are. They have the same um, common. They have the same common subfactor, namely one by by two. And what you could do is you can multiply the subfactor out and put it on on the edge here. Then what's happening is you get a different representation for the submatrix, but you still get the original semantics because if you trans to, uh, trans uh, if you follow one of these edges which has an ed edge weight one by two. It simply means, okay, all the entries of your following submatrices have to be multiplied by that, with that. Why does this help? Well, check out this submatrix here. Here you could also multiply a subfactor out, namely minus one, then you get something like that. Now, again, the same, uh, the same semantics apply. The moment you follow this edge here, there's an edge rate minus one, means all the elements here have to be multiplied by minus one in order to get your main result. So this sort of like still preserves the original information. But what you get additionally is that suddenly by factoring out this minus one here, you get now two uh, submatrices which are identical as well. And this is the, the, the other uh, characteristic of these decision diagrams that you can share identical submatrices, but also submatrices which are structurally identical, but only differ in a common subfactor, like, like, like shown in this example here. And by that, you can have this submatrix, and it still represents the top and left submatrix by following this edge. And you still can represent the bottom uh, left um, submatrix by following this edge and considering this common subfactor, which has to be multiplied in case you want to have access any element of this one here. And long story short, what does it mean? You can do this now recursively throughout the remaining submatrices. And then at the end of the day, you will end up in a decision diagram, which looks like that, which still represents the entire um, uh, unitary matrix. But, and this is a, so, sort of the hope, but in a much, much, much more compact fashion. And this is one possibility towards um, a data structure, which could be used in quantum computing. On top of that, of course, there are also alternative data structures. I just wanted to quickly mention them here. We also have in the community data structures such as tensor networks, such as the ZX calculus. Uh, we have a couple of more. And I'm, I'm just mentioning that and bringing that because I really believe in order to have efficient and powerful tools, we need compact and efficient um, representations of quantum functionality, of quantum states. And decision diagrams, but also tensor networks that X calculus and so on and so forth may provide that. And now the question is a little bit, what can we do with these data structure? Now I'm easing into one of the possible tools and applications which can be developed for the domain and which could help end users in designing, um, designing quantum circuits. And that's simulation. Um, a simulator is very helpful in the design of a quantum algorithm because what a simulator allows you to specify your quantum algorithm or your quantum circuit and then to simulate that before you actually execute it on an explicit machine. This can be sometimes very beneficial because on a, on a simulation on an actual machine, you only result, you only get a probabilistic result. With simulation, you get all the amplitudes of a system state, you get much more in, inside information. And particularly in order to develop a corresponding application, it could be very helpful. And the sweet thing is conceptually, simulation is totally easy because what do you get is you, you have a an, an quantum algorithm or quantum functionality. 
and an input state, and you want to simulate that, that means you want to determine the output state. What happens if you apply your input state on those quantum functionality? What kind of an output state do you get out of it? So this is the main idea. And the sweet thing is this is conceptually very simple because it simply means you take, uh, you take your input state represented as set in terms of a vector, you multiply that with your corresponding quantum functionality, which again is represented in terms of a, of a matrix. And by conducting matrix vector multiplication, you get an output vector, which represents the result. So this is actually what's made very sweet. It's actually very simple. And just to provide you with an example, if you have, for example, an input state one, and the quantum operation H, the Hadamard operation, then you can represent the input state one with this vector, you represent the um, Hadamard operation with this matrix, and then you simply conduct matrix vector multiplication. That means for, for this element here, you multiply one times one about times zero plus one times one with this factor, you get this one. And in a similar fashion, uh, you get this value here below by multiplying one with zero, minus one with minus one uh, with one. That's why you get this minus one, minus one here. And this eventually gives you um, your, your simulation result. So this is really sweet because simulating a quantum circuit conceptually is very, very simple. The main problem, however, is that of course, all those matrices, as we discussed before, and all those states, they are, exp uh, they are exponentially large. And for this, we need efficient representations and the decision diagrams, the uh, ZX calculus, or the tensor networks may provide something like that. And this is why I want what I wanted to showcase as a first example. In order to have efficient design tools such as simulation, data structures or rep efficient representations are key. And the ones I just showed or uh, sketched beforehand could deliver that. And to just illustrate a little bit that the power a good data structure could have on a design tool, on a simulation tool like, like that, is by showing you one example of, of, a simulate, of a simulation instance, which aims at simulating Shor's algorithm. Here we have, uh, I'm, I'm comparing one solution based on, um, on a rather straightforward data structure based on matrices, where we used a simulator by, uh, by Microsoft on an HPC system. So this is a very powerful system in the sense that it has uh, superconduct uh, computers um, using that in order to simulate that. But in order to represent all the matrices and the states for Shor's algorithm, this simulator needed 50 gigabytes and had the simulation time despite being run on an HPC system of 30 days. While as, a, as an example, the decision diagram based solution I sketched before was able to simulate exactly the same thing uh, with a memory requirement of just 100 megabyte and in less than one minute. So this, this example is supposed to, do, to showcase a little bit what kind of potential is possible. But I also have to make crystal clear that it's not always working exactly like that. Also decision diagrams may have a memory explosion problem. It really depends on the respective application, on the use case, on the benchmark, or the application you want to simulate. But what I want to uh, showcase here with that is a little bit that once you have a good portfolio of different um, data structures available, then you may want to use decision diagrams, for example, in this case, because it performs really well for uh, this Shor's algorithm here for this particular instance. And, but then you may have another application and then decision diagrams suddenly tank completely, but maybe tensor networks are your, your choice to go. And this is one of the challenges I wanted to motivate here that uh, we have um, we, and we need this development of efficient data structures in order to improve something like uh, uh, simulation. But so far, and, and there never will be a silver bullet. If we will at some point will find the perfect data structure which uh, represents all quantum functionality with no with linear or with polynomial complexity, then we would not need quantum computer anymore, right? So I'm not saying that our idea is to get data structures which are perfect. They're never going to be perfect. Um, they will always have their, their uh, limits, but we should aim for trying to make to, to push these limits as far as possible so that we can actually use um, efficient design automation, that they actually can develop efficient design automation tools. So this is sort of uh, the, the one thing to, to showcase here. Um, just as a brief plug, I'm, I'm sort of bringing this here and I'm summarizing that at the end of the day as well, that all the tools I'm, I'm going to sketch here are also publicly available in, 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 in GitHub. 
uh, or by simply uh, calling pip install then and then the, this term here you can download all these tools by yourself and then you can play around with that as well and uh, this is also one of the developments what we can really see in the community and i love that really very much the lots of peoples and groups are developing uh, design tools for quantum computing and they're making it publicly available so that we can compare each other that we can actually extend our own tools with the contributions from others and uh, for this decision diagram based simulation uh, the dsim is literally what you can do and as, as you can see here with the very simple python commands you can actually uh, load this uh, quantum circuit and then you can just call uh, you can just instantiate the simulator and then you you call execute with 100,000 shots and then you get the result of the simulation that in 50,000 something cases you get a zero 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 and in 50,000 or approximately 50,000 other cases you get one 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 as a uh, measured output so this is sort of like really um something where you can try out good back to design automation and software tools in general so we covered data structures we covered simulation as one particular use case the next very important one is compilation so what does it mean very similar to the conventional realm as well but with this particular quantum specifics you've got an algorithm on what i would say a high level representation and you've got a target device you would like this algorithm x to be executed on and then of course what what you have, you have several constraints for example that you have a limited gate set that your target device does not support a Toffoli gate like that. And then you need compilation methods to do that. In this particular case, it's easy. We know that, for example, a Toffoli gate like, like this one here is can, can be represented by a sequence of elementary gates as shown here. And this is so uh, this one of the first steps of synthesis, translating in high level, translating high level operations down to low level operations. And of course, you can do that in a very simple um, uh, replacement uh, fashion. But of course, you have also several optimization possibilities, how to realize high level to low level. That's an own an, an topic on its own. Besides that, we have the problem that on the architectures, we have a limited connectivity. For example, they can see here that uh, the physical qubit Q0 can only interact with the physical qubit Q1. And Q1 can only interact with Q0, uh, Q, Q0, Q2, and Q3. And you have to respect that. And this requires, first of all, a mapping of your logical circuit to the target device, and more, most importantly, of your logical qubits to your physical qubits. And now, if you do that, then, of course, you have to satisfy these kind of constraints. And one solution could be, look, I've got three logical qubits. I'm mapping them to these three physical qubits. And then I get a circuit where I have a mapping like that. And now I could execute all those gates because the mapping, for example, if you have these two operations, this works on logical qubit zero, uh, logical qubit two, and logical qubit one, which are, which are respectively mapped to first with one and two. And since one and two are actually allowed to enter one and two, yeah, one and two are allowed to interact with each other. That's the reason why it works out well. However, it fails for this particular gate here. A gate which argues over logical qubit zero and one. So zero and one are these two guys here, which are mapped to physical qubit zero and physical qubit two. Zero and two, however, are not allowed to interact with each other. And now I have the problem that this gate cannot be executed on this target device. And one solution to solve that is swap gates, by this moving the qubit positions around. In this case, we move Q0 closer to Q1. So Q0 moves to Q1, and then suddenly it can interact with Q2 again. And this is then allows the execution of all those remaining gates. And also here, you again have an interesting design automation problem, like, OK, you need to do this mapping. You need, you may have to need to add these kind of swap gates. And if you really think about that for complex circuits, this will up to very complex problems because you've got n factorial, n being the number of qubits. So the number of qubits factorial possibilities of how to map your, your logical qubits to the physical qubits. And then through the way out, you may have to insert swap gates. And the long, the big question is, out of these n factorial or even more possibilities, what kind of possibility do you choose? 
in order to get the circuit, which ideally, uh, which of course satisfies all your, your, your coupling constraints, all your connectivity constraints, and at the same time requires the least amount of swap gates. So this is a big problem in the compilation process of quantum circuits. And then last but not least, typical optimization of things, because even if the resulting circuit has been very cleverly mapped on the device, of course, if, if possible, you would like to keep it still as small as possible, because the longer your circuit, the, uh, the worse uh, is your fidelity, coherence will go up. So ideally, you want to have a very compact circuit. And during this translation process, you may end up with a couple of optimization potential. For example, we know that two H gates in a row can easily be canceled out. So they, these two gates cancel each other out. A TA gate and an H gate can be reduced to something cheaper. So long story short, this is the final step optimization where you actually exploit all these kind of uh, rewriting or these kind of cancellations or optimizations. And then you may get a result which might be might be your actual realization. And what is the, 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 the take home message here is you have this kind of process, a process which is very similar to the synthesis pro, uh, process in conventional computing. You've got synthesis in the sense of translating something from high level to low level. You have a mapping, which is very similar or has some similarities to place and route and also to scheduling problems. And you have this optimization, something we do in conventional synthesis all the time. And in fact, in many, many of these steps here, what you actually end up with is a set of problems, which is very, very similar to typical EDA problems. And actually, uh, uh, all, many of those problems actually have been proven in p hard. So what I'm trying to convey here as a message is that also here, or particularly here, you have a couple of problems which many, many uh, experts in the design automation community in a similar fashion, not for quantum computing, but for a similar setting in electronic and conventional circuits have been tackled for the past 20, 30 years. And of course, we should utilize this expertise in when we want to develop uh, solutions for those particular quantum computation, computation flows here as well. And also here, I mean, I could sketch a couple of things, but we have a, a star-based methods, sub-based methods, you name it, so very powerful methods which can cope with this, as I mentioned before, uh, n factorial large uh, search space in order to tackle with that. And also here, here, I believe this is something where design automation community, where design automation community can make very interesting um, uh, contributions. And also here, and I'm just going to quickly show that also here, you can uh, you have several methods available. Uh, again, this is the method we developed in our group based on um, uh, here a star. We also have a method which is using uh, uh, set solvings in order to solve the problem. And again, with the pip install command, you can easily download or install that on your own machine. And with a small Python script, you can actually uh, in this toy example here um, map and uh, sort of circuit like this one to a particular architecture where you require, in this case, one swap gate. So lots of the, so the, the entry barrier, hopefully, is, is really, really low. So this is about compilation. And uh, now I come to my last example, another which I would like to use to showcase what design automation expertise and tools can uh, deliver. And this is verification. And this is very related to compilation, or it is actually the result of the compilation. Once you have your compiled result, your actual uh, solution, you probably want to know whether or not your compiled result is still functionally equivalent to your originally given high level representation. And this is what verification is about. You've got one circuit and you've got another circuit on the other side and you want to know whether or not they are both functionally equivalent. And again, conceptually, this is very easy because all you have to do is you just take all the matrix from all your gates from this one circuit, you multiply these matrices together, then you get an overall matrix representing the functionality of your left circuit. In this case, you do the same on the right circuit. You consider all the matrices from the single gates. You multiply all those uh, gates together. You get an overall ma matrix representing the overall functionality of your right circuit. And then all you have to do is you simply have to compare these two uh, matrices. And also here, conceptually, very simple. Of course, the problem again is both of those matrices are exponential in 
in size. So how can you deal with that? Again, the data structures I mentioned before can be really useful. For example, for decision diagrams, you could represent the functionality of this circuit in terms of the decision diagram. You could represent the, uh, the functionality of this circuit in terms of another decision diagrams. And if both circuits are functionally equivalent, so should the so, so should the, the, the decision diagrams be functional equivalent as well. And since these decision diagrams use have use lots of sharing, you don't you would not create two of these circuits, but the decision diagrams itself would use this sharing. That means at the end of the day, if both circuits are really identical, you would eventually end up with a data structure like that, where suddenly both pointers, one for the left circuit and one for the right circuit, would point on the same root node. And with this, you would have proven that both circuits are functional equivalent. And again, this is just an example. Uh, for example, uh, we, we just recently investigated also very much, uh, for example, the ZX calculus data structure I mentioned before. And also the ZX calculus is really, really, is a really, really cool data structure, very suited for, for, um, um, for verification. So you can really, again, it, it often boils down. If you have efficient data structures, then you can develop design tools for verification as, as sketched here. But Besides that, and that, that's the cool thing, we can actually do even better than that. And this is something I would like to, to sketch as well, because I find it very interesting. So far, I talked a lot, how can we utilize design automation expertise in order to develop tools for quantum computing? Now I would like to illustrate, and that's the final thing I, I, I'm going to sketch here, and is I want to illustrate how can we actually also exploit characteristics from quantum computing in order to help in our design problems. And verification is a very good example because, again, we want to know whether or not two circuits are functional equivalent. And we can, for this purpose, we can use this proper, uh, property here. Namely, if I have two quantum circuits, G and G prime, and if I assume that both quantum circuits are functional equivalent, then I can take the inverse of one of those circuits, multiply it with the other circuit, and if both are functional equivalent, then, of course, the identity should result, right? Because if, if both circuits realize the same functionality, I take the inverse of one of them, then you create one functionality multiplied with the inverse of the other, it should end up with the identity. And this now is really cool because it could it, it enables lots of potential. Let's play it through. So you have your two circuits, you want to check whether or not they are functional equivalent. First, what you do is, you, you invert one of those circuits. That's easy because everything in a quantum circuit is reversible. And then you multiply now all those gates together and you get the identity or you, you have to prove whether or not this is the identity. And the sweet thing is the identity and the decision and the data structures I introduced before, like decision diagrams, is the best case. This is the decision diagram of the identity function. So this is what makes this whole idea very interesting because representing the identity in terms of a decision diagram is very, very compact. It's linear in the number of qubits. So identity is a very great uh, uh, function or represent, uh, uh, operation which can be very efficiently represented, for example, in terms of a decision diagram. And that's an interesting idea. The problem, however, is, of course, that in order to get this identity, you need to multiply all those single gates together, which means that if you multiply these gates here all together, at this point, you will end up in a decision diagram of the overall functionality. So you don't win anything because you get the overall decision diagram here, and then you multiply these gates together, which may get you to the identity, but your intermediate result might be very big as well. And now you could prevent that by doing the following, by not multiplying everything simply from, from left to right, but by doing the following, you start with the, oops, you start with the identity, and then you say, I'm saying, okay, you're not multiplying all the gates from one circuit and then all the gates from the other circuit, but you do something like you multiply, for example, one gate from this circuit here, and then you multiply the inverse from, another, from, from this gate from the other circuit. By this, of course, you, 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 you still cover all the possible gates, but you stay close to the identity. And if you additionally know that, for example, if you multiply now this Toffoli gate into it, and you know that maybe this Toffoli gate is represented by this amount of elementary gates, you can really keep your decision diagrams very, very compact. And by this, you could do, you could verify this entire uh, 
bones, uh, the equivalents of both circuits with very moderated cost by simply applying some gates from the left circuit, some gates from the right circuit, right? This is sort of like the main idea. And now the question of course is, how do you know when to apply gates from the left, when to apply gates from the right? But here, your compilation flow may provide you a little bit information because you may know that a Toffoli gate always boils down to something like that. You may have to incorporate information about swap gates and qubit mappings. And you may, which is probably a little bit harder, you may be able to incorporate optimization strategies. And I'm, I'm saying at the end of the day, if you get all those information from your compilation flow, you could conduct this verification in a very compact fashion. Uh, and then, of course, if you get that from the compilation flow, you might wonder, okay, do I need a verification anymore? And you're right, if you sort of like have every every single step is that you don't need compilation but considering that compilation flows are very complex these days you may not get all this information but a heuristic could help or to, to put it in other ways the question like the main idea again to, to pick up that over the main idea is to keep your decision like them always close to the identity by and and you do this by applying some gates from one circuit and then some gates from the other circuit in staying compact and it's it literally boils down the uh, getting an efficient verification method literally boils down to the question how many gates should i uh, apply from this circuit and from that circuit and you here you have several strategies some strategies which you can actually um, derive from from the compilation flow some other strategies could be that you apply so many gates from one circuit until your decision diagram gets uh, larger than a certain threshold so i'm, I'm saying there are possibilities and we've got results, we verified entire compilation flows with Qiskit using this method. And we were able to verify several of those instances in zero time. And I personally find it very interesting because verification indeed is something which is very hard in the conventional realm. It remains hard in the quantum computing realm, but we may be able to actually find some clever statistics or method like the one I sketched before to handle this problem in a very, very compact fashion. And also here um, we've got uh, everything is open source again the pip install command will help you to sort of uh, read into circuits like one circuit here uh, then we compile that um, generate another circuit and then we simply verify so, um, so uh, the, the original circuit with the map circuit so these two circuits could be verified and then uh, by by simply calling a verifier it, uh, the tool could tell, tell you that the circuit is equivalent or not also here to mention to, to look a little bit um, outside, uh, also here, particularly when it comes to verification, there are also lots of alternative methods. One very popular one in the conventional realm is SAT solving. And he, here you might know that lots of work exists where you uh, where you encode a conventional circuit like, like, like this one here in terms of a uh, propositional formula. We have initial uh, uh, solutions on how to do this for quantum computing as well. It is much, much harder. And it is uh, because you have certainly to you have to support not just zeros and ones, but also the superposition, the entanglement. But also, this is one way to go, which is where which again exploits design automation expertise. And overall, the main goal of all that is: can we get all those? And I'm switching to this slide directly. Can we get all? the efficient core methods like SAT solvers or data structures like decision diagrams, tensor networks, and so on and so forth. Can we get that to come from, for example, the design automation community, take this expertise in order to then realize um, efficient methods for the simulation, for the compilation, and for the verification of um, quantum. And this is literally what we're aiming for and what many many other groups are doing as well and which in my opinion is a very promising approach to do because it's said without design automation without eda tools this tremendous progress in the last 50 60 years in conventional computing wouldn't be possible and i strongly believe that without a strong design automation community we also will, will won't be able to really exploit the promises of quantum computing and I would also say there are lots of very, very promising uh, results we got all of uh, we got uh, from all our uh, design tools developed so far. Uh, for example, some of our tools have been integrated into Qiskit and into Atos. We've got awarded uh, that, won prizes for that, and so on and so forth. So, so there is actually some real impact we can you can do with these methods. And in order to wrap up my my talk, so what was the main take home message of my talk? 
I, I talked sort of like, I tried to provide you with the idea of, okay, tools for quantum computers, core representations, core um, data structures. And, and then I showcase, uh, hopefully, um, how can we use that for simulation, for compilation, uh, for verification. And um, yeah, for verification. And I hope this gave you an idea of what you can use, uh, what you can uh, this use for. If you didn't got, for example, any details about the decision diagram or about the verification scheme, also this is not such a big point because all of that can be used in terms of a black box. So you can even use it simply as an end user with no and shielding everything about the, the details uh, and more information also now. And as a final uh, 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 plug here as well, if, as I said, you can implement, you can simply use methods from our tabs. If you don't want to install any particular uh, software right now, what you can also do is you can simply access uh, this web page here, and this yields you to a web based uh, an installation field tool. So, this particular the simulator and the verifier can also explicitly execute it and try it out in a web based environment without, without the need to install anything. It also provides a very nice GUI so that you can play around. And with this, I hope I was successful to provide you a little bit with some ideas how design automation and software tools can help in quantum computing and also hopefully motivating you if you're not already in the community or if you're not already started working on tools like that, I hopefully was able to you know, convince you that it might, might may be worth a look and that there are actually some very exciting stuff is going on. With this, I would like to uh, end my talk. Thanks to you. Thank you again very much for all the attention. And of course, again, uh, to the organizers for having me here today. Thanks a lot, guys. And if there are questions, of course, I am um, happy to address them. Yeah, thank you, Professor Will. So we can, uh, I think there are some questions in the chat. So we can start with, um, can you see that in the chat? Yeah, I'm opening it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, first, great that we have some some colleagues from Munich in the uh, in the in the audience. That's good. Great. Um, oh, then the, the the question: there. the verification technique in slide twenty one sounds conceptual, very elegant and simple, but isn't quantum community? Yeah, um, 20, yeah. That, that's it. I can't. I couldn't agree more. That's ex let me switch to the slide. Um, so let's say. Um, yeah. Um, so first of all, you're absolutely right. Uh, verification of two uh, quantum circuits is uh, is proven to be hard, and uh, because of and because of that, this is sort of like a very hard problem. And this solution I sketched here only works because because we've got I called it before heuristic. You can also call it an oracle. This only works so nicely because I know an oracle tells me. Right now, take a circuit from the right hand side. Right now, after that, take a, uh, take a gate from the left hand side. Then take another gate from there, take another gate there. And particularly here, this is interesting. For after you apply this gate, this oracle tells me, well, now take the, uh, all those gates from the left hand side. So it, it remains QMC, QMB hard, actually QMC hard, I guess. And however, if you have a great oracle which tells you, um, how to apply gates from either side, you can end up with very efficient tools and some rationals for this oracle could be provided by your compilation flow. If you know this Toffoli gate is translated to this one, even if some optimizations are done afterwards, you have a very good heuristic helping you to deciding how to keep your decision diagram always close to the identity, close to the linear representation. And that is sort of like where the tricks come in. It, of course, will not work for arbitrary circuits, for arbitrary comparisons, but for practical relevant solutions, it might be a, a good solution. And that's what this is all about. And that's, by the way, also how we tackle in the conventional realm, all those NP hard problems. None of this is efficiently solvable, but for certain practical instances, and sometimes with some back not, back, background knowledge, we are able to, this, to, to cope with this tremendous complexity anyway. And a very similar thing is happening here. I hope this answers the, the question. Yeah, so um, we have um, Ilian from the audience to 
ask the question. So Ilian, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. Um, so my question is, um, we, we're trying to work on these compilation problems such that we can run quantum algorithms in order to solve more NP-hard problems, right? So I think the natural question would be, um, is there hope maybe in the future to use quantum uh, computer to solve these compilation problems such that um, you know we can um, skip this part altogether? Absolutely, a very good question. In fact, I, that, that's a question I get a lot. And um, um, indeed, it makes sense, right? We were making all these developments in order to solve hard, comp computationally hard problems. Why should why not solve why not um, designing quantum applications with that? And I think in the in the uh, there's definitely room for that in a similar fashion like we use today conventional computers in order to design and develop conventional computers, right? So I, I certainly will see there's definitely a point in it. At the, the moment right now, my my assessment of the state of the art is that so far for these particular design problems. The, um, as I said, the data structures, the core methods, and also the availability of very powerful computing machines is still bigger, still better in the, in, the, uh, in the conventional realm. So I would still say right now, most of the developments we're doing in this regard is we're developing classical software for quantum computing. And, and in my opinion, that's the promising way right now. But of course, we have a look in, in, into the fact that once uh, these once the quantum computer is getting more and more mature, maybe at some point we can start designing or dealing complex problems on the quantum machine as well. Right now, we haven't done that. There are a couple of, uh, of course, uh, test balloons going on, on solving sub problems, on solving all kinds of problems. But right now, if you want to realize an, an, an state-of-the-art quantum algorithm, I would still recommend rely on conventional or uh, classical uh, tools for quantum computing, but you're absolutely right. In the maybe in the near future, we're going to have certain solutions for uh, running on on quantum computers for that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we also have uh, Zhu Chang from the audience. Hi, Professor. Thanks for the nice introduction to, to this field. So I have two questions. So first one is, could you give me a, a high level description, like? like what kind of problem is specifically uh, like a suitable for decision diagram? And the second question is, uh, how do you incorporate the quantum noise into such a structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. And the first question, indeed, that 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 is that this is a question we are heavily working on. And it would be great if we would know, uh, also in a general term, not just related to decision diagrams, but also to ZX or the tensor networks, it would be indeed really great if I know I have a certain class of or type of quantum algorithm, it would be great to know, okay, I can simulate that very efficiently with decision diagrams or with tensor networks. So knowing that advance would be great. And I, this is in my opinion, uh, and I, I'm really glad that you brought it up. In my opinion, this is a very interesting and important research question, which hasn't been tackled so far. And let's just, just give me again a brief, um, um, a brief look back to history. In conventional realm, decision diagrams have, as an example, have been used in the conventional realm also very extensively. And for that, I know that in the 90s, Hundreds of papers have been published about upper bounds, lower bounds, about different types of decision diagrams for different classes. And you've got a really great uh, theoretical understanding that, you know, for symmetric functions, BDDs are great. For multipliers, BDD tank, but uh, KFDDs work well, and so on and so forth. And right now, uh, I can't, can't answer you, uh, you the question, what kind of classes of quantum functionality would be good for decision diagrams, because these investigations haven't been done yet. I'm completely with you, we need that, that. And a good starting point, and also here we struggle already, we don't really have a good classifications of quantum functionality. We've got lots of benchmarks and we've got empirical results. We know, for example, that our decision diagrams, they are perfect for entangled states, for QFT and so on and so forth. We also know that other data structures are very efficient for that, but we don't have a comprehensive evaluation of classes. So that is certainly, a good research task, and if 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 the community of some people would be willing to do that, I would be uh, I would be thrilled um, to see results on that. And the second question, I'm really sorry. Help me again. The second question was, 
uh, how to incorporate quantum noise. Right, exactly. Also, very good question. Here, we already did some initial uh, step. Of course, the moment you incorporate a noise, you make an already hard problem even harder. That That's sort of, a, it's a bummer at the beginning. And we have, however, two different directions. One is you can represent in an exact fashion every kind of noise model by, by means of density matrix, ma matrices. Um, and uh, like, like for this unitary matrix here, we also have an implementation which could support density matrices. Then you would cover all possible noises depending on your model. And you can generate decision diagrams out of that as well. So the main idea is very similar. But of course, everything gets more and more complex. That, that, that is one approach. That's what we call the exact approach because it covers noise in an exact fashion. The alternative is uh, you doing, doing it stochastically. So what we did here is you have an error model with certain probabilities. And then you do in a Monte Carlo-like fashion, you just simulate um, with the, the simulator I showed you today, you simulate I don't know, tens of thousands of ones with your error models and your probabilities. And then you get a stochastic uh, consideration of um, uh, uh, noise. And in both cases, what the, what's the take home message? If you do it in an exact, exact fashion, you get, of course, the best possible result, but you really blow up one time in memory consumption. So it's not scalable at all. If you do it in, an, in stochastic fashion, it's still not, not trivial, but you get more results. But at the, at the cost that the results might not be perfectly accurate because they're all only stochastically given, but evaluation shows they are not that bad. But again, that's not, not exact. But this is sort of the two directions we are going for, we, we did so far. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very, very informative answers. Yeah. Thank you. So I also have questions from the chat. Um... Yep. Um... Okay, I'm just reading it quickly. Although efficient simulation, although although efficient uh, simulation, but can we do simulation time? Again? It seems that generally it is not practical to simulate a large number of qubits. Like IBM World Group said, yeah, we have thousands of qubits in the near future. How can we perform design automation on classical computers? Absolutely right. Again, there is a limit, definitely, and um, that's what I what I uh, said before. The goal is not. I mean, if the goal would be find a solution, find the silver bullet which makes simulation efficient on a conventional machine. That is the moment where we made quantum computing obsolete. Because if I at some point can efficiently simulate arbitrary quantum um, applications or uh, functionality on a conventional machine, I don't need the quantum computer anymore. So I, I, I really don't think we were reaching this level at some point, but, and that's exactly the point, the question is how much can we keep up? How much can we push the threshold? Uh, threshold? And for that, I think it makes sense to do research on, on these kind of things, because otherwise we would only be able to simulate three or four qubit uh, um, cases. Now we can simulate a couple of dozens and we should push them further. We should take the development further because we, it's actually very similar like to the question before. If you have a very powerful electronics conventional system, you can use that in order to design a more powerful uh, conventional system as well. And here's the same thing. The, better, the, 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 the more we can push design automation tools like simulation to its limits, the better we can design the next quantum computing application. I, I hope this sort of addresses the question. But you're absolutely right that we, we will always, at some point, we will always end up with a certain size of quantum application which cannot be handled anymore. Okay, I hope this, this covers the question. Then the next one, can you construct a circuit out of the decision diagram? Yes, that, that's possible. And um, maybe the, the best slide for that is this one here. Um, actually, what you do is, if you have a circuit given like that, what you do is, you generate um, a decision diagram from this single gate, which can be done very easily because it's just a, a two qubit gate. You generate um, a decision diagram of this gate. You generate a decision diagram of the, of the neighboring gate. And then you do matrix matrix multiplication, multiply that together. And then you continue getting a decision diagram of this gate, multiply it with your previous result. And that's exactly what I showed you. If you multiply, if you, Check if you represent all those gates in terms of decision diagrams, and then you multiply these decision diagrams together, you get this one here. So maybe the message I, I was was I missed to, to say before with those decision diagram, you cannot only efficiently represent a quantum gate or a quantum operation or functionality, but you can also very, very easily 
multiply or uh, manipulate those representations. So once you have a decision diagram or two decision diagrams of two matrices, you can very easily multiply them together as well. And this is exactly how you, that's actually most of the cases how we're doing it. We take a quantum circuit and out of this circuit, we create a decision diagram. Good, I hope this covers this question. And then there's another one. Are there cases where DD performs better than ZX? And also, this is a great question, and this is exactly what we could be trying to do, similar to the question before. We're trying to evaluate for what use case is decision, are decision diagrams better, for what are ZX better, and so on and so forth. And here we indeed just recently had a couple of investigation, investigations, and there's, for example, one thing, um, ZX, ZX is not complete. So ZX can show you the equivalence of a circuit, but if it doesn't show you the equivalence, it does not mean that both are suddenly not equivalent anymore. So there are definitely, um, it is not only the question about performance better or not, that, that often depends on the functionality. We have evaluations where sometimes the decision diagrams perform better, sometimes ZX, but beyond that, it is also the conceptual question. Sometimes just conceptually, decision, uh, ZX can deliver uh, with, uh, can, uh, so it's sometimes decision diagrams can deliver a, a result where ZX is not uh, is inconclusive. And roughly, I said we did some investigation. I hope that that I don't somewhere in very wrong fashion. But my 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 our gut feeling is right now that X that X is very powerful. And if you get a result, maybe this is the better thing to go with that X first. If you don't get a result with that X because it's inconclusive, then the decision diagram might be an option to make it complete. That's my rough statement here, but it really depends. And that's it's exactly what I meant and why I'm really happy that we have an entire community working on complementary um, approaches because, again, there won't be a silver bullet. I'm not saying decision diagrams are the solution for everything, nor do I say ZX or Tensor Networks are the solution of anything. I think the strength of our community is that we have several methods and they are complementary to each other. It's not like ZX is always factor 10 better than decision diagrams, but for something where one representation totally sucks, another representation might be beneficial. And I think this is the power we have that we have, the more we have on, uh, on these complementary approaches, the better we can perform on those design tasks. And I also hope that I this sort of covered this questions, this question. You're welcome. Thank you very much.